came in there, come up to the platform and uh, open the Bible and clear his throat and call the congregation to attention and uh, pray a prayer and open his mouth and commence without a terrible sense of dread or foreboding of, of all of the great weight that falls upon that moment. Because if it's not the word of God, instead of life going forth, it seems death goes forth. There's a deadening. It, it, there's no neutrality here. Either something is going to forward the life of God, or there's going to be a numbness, a dullness, a dull-spiritedness, by just hear, hearing something that is only merely good. We probably would be better off not to hear at all. Mm -hmm. Silence is more to be desired than a mere uh, clever, good play on words that does not communicate the life of God as God's word. Mm -hmm. The result is a deadening of spiritual sensibility. So in a message that he, that he is entitled The Task of the Ministry, he cries out, How can human utterance carry an irresistible and compelling meaning? How can it be capable of bearing witness because, to God? How can mere human speech? This is, this has got to register on us. This paradox, this terrible contradiction that is going to come out of the mouth of a man that the vessel is human and earthly, but the word itself is divine and heavenly. And it's not as if the instrumentality is some kind of utilitarian thing that is uh, objective and does not participate in the process. And something just courses through him like an enema. He's involved. The, the Lord employs his personality, his accent, his disposition, his heart, his, the, the Lord who knows his history, who formed him in his mother's womb. And there's a, an aliveness of the play of all of these factors in that given moment mm. that will never be quite the same the next Sunday. Mm. It's his mood, it's disposition, it's what happened yesterday or on the way to the church or some episode or crisis or something brought to his recall. Or there's a dynamic, there's an amalgam, it's an electric existential moment mm. preaching. This is probably worth more than most homiletics courses. Yeah. In fact, I wrote a paper, and I shared it in previous uh, classes of the prophetical school on the anatomy of apostolic proclamation. I always come up with fancy titles. That is to say, what is the genius of apostolic preaching as it is distinguished from other kinds? Why does Paul say, how shall they believe on him of whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear except one preach? For faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. A Danish theologian said of that statement of Paul, Jews are waiting for ap apostolic proclamation. They may not know it, but four spiritual laws is not going to do it for them. They need to hear a word of an apostolic kind by a man who is sent from a sending body that bears the whole configuration of apostolic reality, and that word will create faith in the hearing of it yes. by those who not only did not have it, but were antagonistic to it. Yes. Yes. Well then, what's the genius of that? What's the anatomy? What's, what's, what's the specific character of, of the apostolic proclamation that's not to be found elsewhere? Tune in at this station. <laughs> <laughs> Come back next year. <laughs> But just to say, that, uh, to give you this much to chew on, if you can but understand it. True preaching, apostolic proclamation, every time is the reiteration of the cross. Whatever took place at Calvary in the suffering and death of Jesus has somehow to take place in the preached word. Whenever the preached word becomes safe, predictable, where the man knows in advance, where he has prepared himself with an eye toward being impressive or being found acceptable or being saved from embarrassment or humiliation or failure, there is the guarantee that that word will not be apostolic. 
The reiteration of the cross is trembling, fear, public nakedness, the prospect of humiliation, and altogether failure. And trust of an ultimate kind that yea, though he slay you, yet will you live. And uh, it was clear to me in the in a seminary for two years, going to the chapel every day and listening to a Bible dissertation from very competent men, that I have, I'm not able to remember one such statement in two years of speaking of men who were theologically very sound, because they knew months in advance which day would be theirs. And they prepared themselves to the teeth. I suspect not because they wanted to be right, but also that they should not fail, should not collapse in front of their students and their colleagues. There was no room for the life of God to get in. Now, how many men have stood in profound places of responsibility and hearing or hearing themselves having been introduced and are now up and have not even the knowledge of what they ought to speak and have to trust God in the moment for the proclamation. I don't say that that's a standard operating procedure. It's the prophetic mode, and I wouldn't expect for pastors necessarily or teachers to have that kind of utter radical necessity, but there's got to be some measure of it. There's got to be some abandon before God, some willingness to risk failure, uh, to let go of the security of your prepared message and let God be God, because in those moments, his life is revealed. It's a suffering of the kind, minuscule kind, of what was experienced at the cross. But first we need to get the dilemma in our spirits, the impossibility of it, and then we will appreciate all the more the, the, the faith, the place of unction and anointing. writes or spoke, what are you doing, you men, with the word of God upon your lips? Upon what ground do you assume the role of mediator between heaven and earth? Who has authorized you to take your place there and to generate religious feelings and to crown all to do so with result, with success? Did anyone ever hear of such overwhelming presumption? But doesn't the profession of the ministry inevitably involve this? Is not the whole situation in the church an illustration of man's chronic presumption, which is really worse here than in any other field? Can a minister be saved? <laughs> I mean, it's so hopeless, it's so untenable that a man's going to speak for God? What? What presumption can such a man be saved? I would answer that with men, this is impossible. We may, um, but as far as we know, there's no one who deserves the wrath of God more abundantly than the ministers. We may as well acknowledge that we are under judgment. As a matter of fact, the church is really an impossibility. There could be no such thing as a minister. Who dares? Who can preach knowing what preaching is? The situation of crisis in the church has not yet been impressed upon us with sufficient intensity. One wonders if it ever will be, because he's seen generations of men go through the diploma mill and be fitted and ordained and come into churches and move their way up the religious ladder. And so these are objections which we would have to raise against ourselves if we were more clearly conscious of what as ministers we are daring to do. If God has chosen us, if he will justify us as ministers in the church situation, we may be certain that he will do so only when we come under judgment, when the church comes under judgment, when our ministry comes under judgment, for it is not until then that we can obtain the promise that we can believe. Judgment must be begin in the house of God. 
a judgment from which only the word of God can extricate and save us, as it can extricate all flesh, save all flesh. Our refusal to examine ourselves first can mean only that we are not satisfied with the promise that we will not believe. How are the people to hear this in the Christian preaching of the church if the church itself has not yet heard it? How is the world to hear it? The church has not heard the realization of this predicament. The ministers who are concerned for the church are no longer equal to the infinite seriousness of our pressing condition. We need ministers who are efficient, but not necessarily efficient in business. Ministration of the word is not administration, however smoothly it may go. Its efficiency will have to prove itself in situations into which, in business, only the inefficient are drawn. Well, I'm just spot reading, just to get uh, the sense of his uh, existential anguish, his awareness of the impossibility of what a man is called to do as a minister to bring God's word as God's word. Yeah. Well, what is needed is the key of David. And um, whether we're using it rightly or not, at least in this context, we're using it to refer to the remarkable phenomenon of anointing. You know, even an awkward message, even one that's ungrammatical, uh, even one that is slipshod and lacks polish, and if it has unction and anointing, it's a vehicle for life. It moves men. It performs something. It, it creates. It sets in motion. The unction is all. And so we want to understand what's the, where does it come from and who has it and how is it to be obtained. And a brother who has come into our knowledge wrote an article called The Key of David. And um, I took that article. I was impressed by it. And then I revised it. I, I sifted it through myself. By the way, are you writing articles? Every serious believer ought to be writing articles. It may be that no one will ever see them. But uh, it's good for you to wrestle with the word and to get down on paper. Bart says in one place, uh, I need to write this or speak this so I can find out what, what my thought is on this subject. <laughs> And I think I've shared with people that uh, I was an academic whiz kid. They used to post my grades on the top of the board, and then they went down and went into the bell curve for the rest of the class. But when it came to be a teacher and to communicate what I thought I knew, I was an absolute flub. I stood before junior high school kids with an American history class, and I, 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 I thought I knew it. I had it somewhere in my head. But when I had to get it out in a word, it simply was not there. And it was going all the way back to square one. I had to re-educate myself all over again because I did not know as I ought to know. Because I could not communicate it to others. You don't know until you can communicate it. Don't think that, well, I've got it. I know what salvation means and the Holy Spirit and the church and the last days and this, this, the mystery of Israel. You don't really know it until you can communicate it. So uh, writing is good. And here's his article and then my adaptation of it. It begins with uh, the revelation to Peter when Jesus said, Who do men say that I am? And Peter answered, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you're a Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not overcome it. Well, we know what Catholicism has done with that portion of Scripture, mm -hmm. and it has celebrated Peter, rather than celebrating the anointing or the anointed revelation by which he understood who Jesus was. Mm -hmm. And that this knowledge was not even given to John the Baptist, though he was a cousin of Jesus mm -hmm. and grew up with him, and had every daily opportunity to see that this was a spectacular child. This was one who was able to dispute in, in the temple at the age of 12 with doctors of the law and confound them. You, you mean that he was so dense he could not recognize there's something unusual about my cousin. And I've heard 
you know, somewhere down the line, how his mother became pregnant with him, and the Holy Ghost spoke to her, and that he's to be the deliverer of Israel, and the way to... None of that was a factor in setting forth Jesus before the nation Israel. He had to reveal Jesus to the nation, not on the basis of any natural observation or knowledge, but on the basis of the revelation that came in the very waters of baptism itself, when the dove came and abode upon him. Say, this is the Lamb of God who has come to take away the sins of the world. Revelation is a mighty phenomenon and an operation of the Spirit of God. It's an anointed kind of seeing where you gasp. You know that they're seeing and seeing and knowing and knowing? There's some kind of knowledge where you can nod your head and you technically it falls into place. There's another kind of knowledge that when it comes you gasp. You, you, you clap your hand over your mouth and it's virtually the same thing the difference is one has come by deduction and the other has come by revelation and maybe as much as we are talking about the phenomenon of anointing and speaking we, we might one time as well speak about the phenomenon of anointing and seeing and that Jesus the Christ means the anointed one so Great reverence for this phenomenon of anointing, which I think has been lost to the church. And it's interesting that this key that is given to Peter on the basis of a revelation that did not come to him from man, but from the Father, by an operation of the Spirit, is the key of binding and loosing the things which are in heaven and in earth. And becomes foundational to all the, the church that what you shall bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and what you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. How come? Because your binding and your loosing will be as much the operation of revelation as the revelation of who Christ is. You're not going to be binding arbitrarily, and you're not going to be loosing arbitrarily. It's not that you're given an office of a kind where you can indulge yourself and bind and loose at will. Amen. The reason that what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, what you loose on earth is loosed in heaven, because it's the same agreement. Because you're binding by the revelation of what is the will of God in heaven. The union is the anointed binding and anointed loosing. It's not that God has condescended to come behind and say, okay, so long as you bound that, I'll bind it too. It's union with God and with his mind and heart and will. And maybe that's what they mean when they say God anoints what he appoints. When you're in agreement, there's an unction from heaven that indicates God's approval on that word. So this brother saw the revelation of Peter to be the manifestation of the anointing upon him and not Peter himself. Likewise, it is upon the operation of the anointing that authority is exercised to bind them to loose, that the key of David is not to be found in any office, quote and unquote, that a man might necessarily hold, but in the operation of the spirit that is a statement of union through relationship with the bestower of spirit, a man's heart in unison with God's heart. That this is not fixed or irrevocable rests on a moment-by-moment -moment abiding in that union, because the same Peter in one moment who says, Thou art the Christ, in the next moment says, Lord, let this be far from you. And he's rebuked and says, uh, Satan, get thee behind me. I say, I'm so grateful for that lest we would think that something permanent had happened to Peter that is irrevocable and will go on now and all of his judgments will be flawless and, and, and uh, faultless. The very next statement, he reverts back to his unanointed humanity and mere sentimentality. That sounds so kind. Lord, let this not be far from you. He didn't need the anointing. It goes without saying that the Lord should be spared any suffering of that kind. And he received the most severe rebuke that a man can receive who is equated with Satan, who the moment before was called blessed. Mm -hmm. if, if nothing else would show how the anointing of God is a moment-by-moment -moment thing, mm -hmm. and not some fixed thing upon which we can cast our assurance as if we have it made, we would, we would be in a much greater place of respect and trembling before God. I'm a little bit suspicious 
of men who seem always to be under a kind of unction and wonder whether it's the unction of the uh, amplifier turned up and their kind of uh, um, sense of camaraderie and they have a certain joie de vie, how do you French say it? You know, a certain uh, spirit of uh, vitality. But is that the unction? Is that the holy unction? Or is that some kind of other oil? Kind of the oil of human personality which can dupe untold numbers in congregations Mm -hmm. of of God's people who don't even know the difference. Mm -hmm. That if a man is smooth, impressive, and has a certain flair about him, that's considered to be the anointing. Mm -hmm. But it's remarkable when the anointing does come before the very same people, they are almost invariably offended. Yes. Amen. Sure. So I praise God that it requires a moment-by-moment union and agreement with God in his purpose and his will and his understanding. And I shared a, an illustration, David, uh, this morning of how very early in my service for the Lord, just one or two years of maybe my first years of believing, giving my testimony, how the Lord withdrew his anointing in one moment of time because he heard my secret heart boasting as if it was with me. Because everyone was falling like flies. They were all uh, captivated by this testimony. It had such power that I thought it was my baby. And the Lord said, oh yeah? True, watch this. (laughs) In one split second, one infinitesimal thing that felt like an eternity. Uh, there's There's no way to describe the feeling of the anointing being removed. Uh, Now Samuel is the first of Israel's great prophets. Now why did God not allow any of his words to fall to the ground? Because he was fastidious not to allow any of God's words to fall. Mm -hmm. And the very first words that he was given as a child Mm -hmm. were the words of judgment against Eli himself Mm -hmm. and his house, which he did not withhold a syllable in his obedience. What a picture of the prophetic man from its inception and that it begins with judgment. The Lord didn't start him out with some more elementary thing. He gave him the most severe word, and that had to be communicated with uttermost fidelity. And all Israel knew that a prophet had come to the nation. Uh, let's dwell on this for just a moment, because we have to make a decision here. Is it that the office of prophet is such that the anointing is continually on such men, or that they are in such a quality of relationship with God continuously that they're enjoying a moment by moment presence in that union of anointing. You know, this this is like um, we have to di- dissect this. Lest we think it's a fixed administrative thing, what we need to recognize is the consistent faithfulness of the prophet. If he seems to be for always under the anointing, is because he's always in the place of obedience and yieldedness to God. Even with Jesus, when it says that the Spirit came down as a dove and abode upon him, was that then a fixed dispensation, so to speak, or that the Spirit of God as a sensitive dove abode and dwelt because the Lord never gave any ground for offense to that sensitive Spirit by which it would be grieved and be required to lift from him. It's the one or the other, and I choose to think it's the one. He walks so consistently in obedience to the Father that the Holy Dove never had a reason to be repelled. So the key of David is not to be found in any office then as man might ne- that a man might necessarily hold, but in the operation of the Spirit that is a statement of union through relationship with the bestower of Spirit, a man's heart in unison with God's heart. This is not fixed and irrevocable, but rests on a moment-by-moment abiding and is demonstrated by the shameful let this be far from you rejection of Messiah's suffering by Peter that followed. So he's on one moment, he was off the next. The fact that Peter heard from God directly without the need for hearing through another man was evidence of God's presence through his spirit in Peter's life. This is the no other foundation that is laid than that which is laid, which is in Christ Jesus. Then he talks about the five foolish virgins who had no continuing supply and whose lamps were going out at midnight. Of all time for the light to fail, it's when it's most powerfully needed 
in the hour of darkness that shall come upon the earth, midnight being the darkest hour. But they ran out, or their supply was threatened at the time when they, it was most desperately needed, which may be a statement of an inadequate relationship with the source. Why else would the bridegroom later say when they came, I tell you the truth, I do not know you. In a word, the oil, symbolic of the anointing, is relative to the degree of intimacy of the reality of his presence through his spirit. I would say in proportion to reality itself. That word came up earlier this morning, earlier in our talk. It's a statement of union and of an alignment with God in the things that are true as God himself sees it, that is utterly real, things as they are, without the subtlety of deceit, especially as it pertains to ourselves in ministry and in calling. The moment that there's a divergence and a moving away from an alignment with the truth of God, which is God, we are no longer in that union by which that life is given, which is called anointing. So there's a conjunction between reality and anointing. There's a conjunction between truth and anointing. It's not some magical disposition. It has to do with character, charisma and character, which has not been underlined or made clear uh, in our charismatic history. You know what this is? This is an experimental program. We're trying to feel for something and understand for something. And um, so I'm appreciating all of the input. I'm just sharing with uh, David that this is how Karl Barth himself wrote his church dogmatics, his 14 <coughs> volumes. He made his papers, and then he brought it the next day to school and shared it with his students, and they interacted over it. Then he went back and redid and adjusted and edited, and, and then finally it found its way into the publication. So, you know, this is more like what church ought to be. More of God's people involved in wrestling through these issues of truth and the issues of the faith and having... A, a participation in it rather than the passivity of mere Sunday attendance and looking up and uh, nodding and, and leaving. It's the Berean Christians. Yeah, good. Who out these things. Yeah, so I'm appreciating this for the benefit that comes to me to hear the, the, um, the responses. Well, I wrote, nowhere is... Um, this issue of character and charisma, the connection between union and truth and reality with God, more violated than by ministers who are, feel free to use the phrase, God said to me. I remember my stupefying uh, astonishment at a full gospel, I forgot, in Germany, I think it was, a speaker who was a minister... I don't know if it's coincidental or significant. He was wearing like a Gucci shirt, a, a real elaborate clothing and uh, chains on his wrist and all that kind of stuff. But he began by saying, God said to me this morning, and when he said that, I, I, I startled and I, I leaned forward and my jaw was open. I wanted to hear what God said to him. It's evidently for us. And then he went on to, to say what it was and I slumped back into my seat and sagged. God had said nothing. It was a cliche. Mm -hmm. It was a truism. It was a kind of a thought, a commonplace. But he gave it a bit of luster with the preface, God said to me. This is the kind of presumption that will assure that the dove will flee. It already flew. Had already and maybe for that reason, such men need to be compelling externally and, and have a certain uh, air to them. So the subject, the issue of hearing from God, what this, and, and, and to say that you hear, is a remarkable question in the issue of anointing. I'm quoting from a scholar who talks about prophetic hearing, and he says, in most cases, there can be no talk of audition in the strictest sense. It's a rare thing to hear from God audibly. I, I can count the occasions in 32 years on the fingers of one hand. 
But there's another kind of prophetic hearing that has not to do with that which is audible, mm -hmm. but that which is inward. Mm -hmm. um, something about, he says, the ideas that emerge in the soul of the inward being of the prophet because of the conviction that it was given him from God and did not originate in the man himself. Like, um, for myself, the awareness that Israel, present political Israel, has to die. That there must be a resurrection. So that when the, when the text comes, or the uh, intifada breaks out to punctuate the text, there's already a yea and amen in my spirit. I already, I've heard, I, I understand, something has already grown up in my heart of understanding inwardly that God has given by the process of God. And then he talks about this, the original writer, the Spirit of God is in the parable is the oil. We are the jar that contains the oil. And if when Jesus returns, we do not contain the oil, our testimony of his reality is merely words and not our very life being sustained by the power of the oil of his Spirit living in us. And he will express this unreality and say, I never knew you. My spirit, when, I, when he says, when the Lord says, I never knew you, the Lord is saying, my spirit never had communion, the, the, the essence of my being with your essence. Mm -hmm. There was no cup of wine on the Shabbat. And I watched and my eyes went large. They poured. And I heard, well, I'm sure the cup is full by now. And they continued pouring. <laughs> and I wanted to restrain the brother and hold his arm back. And... He just went on insanely until the cup overflowed. <laughs> so what, what waste? But that, in their view, and these are people who are yet waiting for spiritual illumination, in their view, Kiddush is not Kiddush unless the cup overflows onto the saucer. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Merely to fill the cup is to fall short. And we sing, fill my cup, Lord. We ought to be singing, overflow my cup, Lord. And when I think of oil, and the sons of oil, who are lubricated and oiled up, uh, somehow the very sense of that rec me, re implies overflow. Mm. It, just to fill it to the level, or to the measure, it does not quite meet it. it the, the issue of unction is that that very point, and I've never said this before, I've never thought this before, it's at that very point that unction is unction. It's at the point where utility is exceeded. And the legitimate amount overflown is the place of the luxuriating unction of God. More than what the moment requires. It's beyond utility. And we Westerners are so utilitarian. We want the measure sufficient for the level of operating uh, efficiency. But praise God for these Jews who know that it's not valid until it overflows the cup. Kiddush. It's the cup of sanctification. I, I chanted that prayer uh, Friday night when we had that wonderful meal. We had wine. That's the prayer for the cup, the sanctifying <coughs> cup, out of which the Lord, uh, from the Passover table, gave us the communion. So I wonder if even then, the understanding was the overflowing cup is the true cup. And merely to bring it to the line is yet somehow to fall short, you know. And uh, what did Jesus celebrate? There's only one act in, in the Gospels that he called a good work. Works, as a rule, were anathema to him. And the thing that he called a good work was the woman who came with the alabaster box and broke it and poured the ointment out upon him lavishly and wastefully. Watchman Nee on his comment on this says, the principle of power is the principle of waste. Yes. It's when it's lavish, when it's outpoured, like, like the Lord himself. His, his life was poured out as a sacrifice for many. But we are stingy. And uh, they've never forgiven me in New Zealand uh, what's the word that I used? You know the way in England and... Fastidious. F huh? Fastidious. Not fastidious, okay. no. Begins with a P, but I, it doesn't matter. Uh, in, instead of bringing the dishes on the table and then you take according to your appetite, they give you your plate. Here's your piece of meat, here's your one and a half potatoes, here's your carrots, your, your peas. 
It's nice. It's adequate. It's good. But it's not lavish. It's not extravagant. It's not over. It's at the level of need. And I, and I gave that as an illustration in New Zealand. I don't think they've forgiven me since. Uh, it says of that woman who, uh, maybe another episode of the same kind, that broke the box, I think was Mary, and poured the ointment on his feet. It says the whole house was filled with the fragrance. And the, and the, and the disciples had the indignation at the waist. But Jesus said, leave her alone, for she hath done a good work upon me. And wheresoever this gospel shall be proclaimed in the world, this that this woman hath done shall be spoken of as a memorial to her. Talk about himself being lavish, himself giving a compliment of the most remarkable kind. He never uh, 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 made a compliment to his disciples or said, well done, good and faithful servant. Never anything like that. But this woman, this one act, he makes this thing, wherever the gospel shall be proclaimed in all the earth, in all future generations, this that this woman hath done shall be a memorial unto her. Because what she has done is the epitome, the essence and the heart of what the gospel itself is and what God himself is as the lavish God who pours out. And uh, it's that same heart. Yeah, I think we need to adjust our brain boxes because our mindsets have been more formed in the world that speak about efficiency, uh, avoiding waste and... I'm schooled in the depression. I can't bear waste. But this kind of waste, I have a tolerance for. This is extravagance unto the Lord. And uh, it's the kingdom measure is above that which is merely required or sufficient. And that's where we fall short. And I would say an anointed vessel would be the description of that. They, they just luxuriate in the oil of God. They, they, they squish because there's an abiding overflow there's a continual communion and a seeking of, of the Lord so if I never knew you is a statement of the absence of that kind of communion by which the life of God is imported, imparted which is the oil of God um, I would say that the deepest source of that oil of communion is in the fellowship of his sufferings and that came up earlier in our discussion this morning <coughs> that preaching which is a suffering and not a blast uh, is going to uh, not only be anointed for the hearer but is going to unctionize the soul of the bearer of that word it's as if God knows the suffering and gives a compensatory thing a certain kind of unction to bear it because true preaching is painful True witness is painful. True prayer is, is, is painful. True intercession is racking and demanding. We're, in a word, the, every aspect of the faith is an untoward demand. It, it, it's an exceptional requirement. It strains us. It stretches us. And maybe the Lord's compensation, it's not the sole mean, reason, is the oil. The oil of gladness that was given Jesus... I, uh, above his brethren because he loved righteousness and he hated iniquity that's not merely that he had an academic category but that hating iniquity was going to be a remarkable drain on him and mark him as an enemy with men make him an object of derision and hatred and the love of righteousness will always bring a retaliatory thing in a world that does not have a heart for righteousness so his very love of righteousness is in the hatred of iniquity required and gave him an oil of gladness even beyond that of his brethren. I remember, uh, was it last year, but the coming close to the prophetical school and the Lord had not given me a glimmer of what direction it would take or what themes would be considered and I was getting a little anxious. I mean, you would too if people are coming from different parts of the world and you certainly don't want to see them return disappointed and uh, that they should receive something worth the, the expenditure of time and energy in coming. And yet I had them in. And a woman from Alaska called me and I was saying, pray for me, I don't have a, the faintest direction for the school. Oh, don't worry about it, Aunt, she said. Uh, just when the time comes, open your mouth. Mm-hmm. What she was saying is, it's already there, it's resident, God will give you, uh, just let the overflow work. And uh, 
I, I think I, I see so, something of that truth. I'd like to see more of it. And I'd like to suggest that as a picture, not just of responsibility in, for school, but for what God would desire for us all. That we open our mouth, that we're always oiled up. There's always an unction. We're in season. We're, how does it say? In season and out. Yeah. We're always ready. Uh, there, there's a lubricating quality of our life. Nothing can take us by surprise. We're instant in prayer. We don't have to get prayed up to meet the demand of a situation that suddenly is thrust upon us. Our conversation, our fellowship between ourselves is anointed. I've had conversations with Reggie in the car that we've had to record. <laughs> I mean, they were golden moments and breakthrough of a creative kind and illuminations uh, popping just like so um, all of these are expressions of that overflowing oil that comes in communion with the Lord, and I think especially in his sufferings. And I go on now to develop, develop that. My suspicion is that a certain residue remains from every vital act of communion in prayer, real prayer, prayer that is urgent, fervent, consistent, it is in every act of obedience that brings peril to body and soul, to reputation and self-interest. It's uh, a residue that comes in confessions at our humiliation, in self-denial of food and sleep, in abandonments of faith that stake all for his namesake. Every costly act of righteousness, and in a parenthesis I have, is it righteous if it costs nothing? is a fragrant aroma of Christ because it is the reiteration of the cross and the revelation of himself. So if in millennial Israel her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation is a lamp that burns, what of ourselves presently as the church? It's Israel's righteousness that goes forth as brightness. So I'm saying there's a residue compounded and obtained and accumulated with righteous acts, with devoted service, with communion with God, with sufferings that come from obedience, and obediences that are not required but are freely given, in acts that the Lord does not compel you to perform, but which you choose to hear and to do at your own loss and at your own inconvenience. That instances like that are productive of the forming of the residue of oil. And that would have, if that's true, that would explain why it is that one would have a greater supply than another. There's more of a history, more instance of faithfulness, sacrifice, true communion, true prayer, relationship, uh, in which that unction is expressed because it's the aroma of Jesus. It's himself who is righteous and comes forth in the righteous act and in the righteous moment out of, out of yourself. Maybe that's what it means, that uh, they had the oil of themselves or in themselves. It was the residue of God that came from a history of faithfulness and obedience. With each act of devotion, something cumulative is added. We are storing up for ourselves this brother writes, a reserve of oil which will sustain our spiritual lives in the time of testings that are to, be come, that are to come. That phrase about storing up to us, others are storing up to themselves judgments. Now, I'm just talking like a fool here. This, this is not definitive. This is not thus saith the Lord. I'm just feeling and suspecting, trying to understand why it is that some have a greater residue than others. And what other the principle, so to speak, or the dynamic by which a residue is obtained. A, a, trying to understand why it is that some have a greater residue than others. And what other, the principle, so to speak, or the dynamic by which a residue is obtained, a, a cum, accumulation of the oil of God, that at midnight we should not be found wanting. Every act of devotion, with each act of devotion, something cumulative is added. We are storing up for ourselves, he says, a reserve of oil which will sustain our spiritual lives in the time of testing to come. In sum, the anointing is the 
attestation of the cumulative, the evidence of the cumulative increase that comes from God through the moments of costly obedience, reproach, and rejection born for his sake. That could have been avoided if we had not been jealous for his glory. There's a getting by where we avoid conspicuous sin and we keep our noses clean, we don't get into trouble, and we have a fairly clean record. But there's a realm of conduct, of life and relationship and devotion that takes risks because the issue of God's glory is at stake that need not be taken. It's voluntarily undertaken because of a jealousy for his glory that God does not make as simple requirement. And in those places, something is given of himself because it's the essence of himself. It's the outpoured God now finding that same expression in a saint and the giving of himself in his own character is the oil. This guy says it's living a life of dying, the carrying around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 5 through 11, I think is about as um, accurate a statement of this. Verse 10 says, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. For we who are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death works in us, but life in you. This whole conversation today began in a discussion of life and versus death. The life of God is given in proportion to the measure of death suffered for his name's sake. We're always subject to death that the life of God may be manifest in us. That life is his spirit and his spirit is the oil and it's fragrant as well as illuminating. That's why elsewhere Paul says we are the fragrance of, uh, how does, of life to life and death to death. Of life unto life unto some and death unto death for others. It's the same fragrance. And I've experienced that going up at the elevators mm -hmm. with uh, big shot charismatic personalities that didn't even know me. I didn't know them, but something went forth in silence that made these guys arch their backs because there's a fragrance emitted of which we're not even conscious. Mm -hmm. That is the cumulative... Uh, deposit of God that men either sense as fragrance unto life or something that is unto death and it's the same fragrance but it's come by process of communion well maybe in conclusion we can go back to where we began in Zechariah chapter 4 with the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth who empty the golden oil out of themselves in Revelation 11 they're called the two witnesses which I think is the same word for martyr it's not that they die as that but that they have lived as that and that that is the witness and the fragrance of Christ and there's something about that unction and that anointing that invariably seems to provoke a radical response of one kind or another. Men either gnash at you with their teeth or they fall before you and say, men and brethren, what must we do to be saved? Right. The anointing of God invites radical response. It's virtually impossible to be neutral in, in regard to it. It's, it will excite the one response or the other. And maybe that may be an unconscious reason why people would avoid uh, being in that unction. They will not welcome radical responses to themselves. This is about being in the counsel of God and have received uh, my counsel in the secret place. And uh, we're told about the tabernacle construction and the holiest place of all, where we are bidden to come that we might receive 
before the Shekinah presence of God, instruction and commandment for the sons of Israel. So men who are not just preaching sermons to fit the need of the hour to satisfy their hearers, but want the word of the Lord in commandment for sons can only find it in one place. It's in the holiest place of all. Before the Shekinah presence of God, where his Shekinah presence is the emitting of his own glory. And while you're seeking him and waiting and dwelling in that place for an illumination and an understanding, you're also receiving something emitted out of that Shekinah. So our true and consistent proximity to the Lord is the key to, the, to this key of David that unlocks and binds the infusion of the spirit of glory out of his Shekinah presence. So you have to pray for me because uh, I'm often consciously seeing myself in that place, asking the Lord for inspiration and for his commandments. And I say, and let there be an infusion of the spirit of your glory that comes out of that holy place where you've told us to wait and to seek you for instruction for sons. If we have made our own determination of what we think is a suitable message and acceptable to our hearers, we have not sought the Lord in that place. And therefore, not only has there not been the communication of the now re uh, giving thing of God, but we have not received the infusion that would have been ours by waiting in that place. So I want to encourage you that this is more than uh, play on words or fancifulness. There is such a place in heaven, and we're called to dwell in it by faith, and that there's a place to seek God. All the more if we're conscious, what do we speak? What is the life-giving word? What needs to be proclaimed? Whether men seem to be ready for it, or will desire it, or refuse it, or be offended, Lord, this is beyond any ability for man to determine. What would you have for me to say? And men who will make this their frequent and continual pattern receive in that place not only instruction, and it doesn't always come as a clear understanding. You, you sometimes finish your prayer and get, away, come, get up and away from that without even knowing that you've received something. And you hear it out of your mouth when you get up to speak. But my point is that not only have you received an answer, you've received infusion Amen. in the holiest place of all, where God is, by his Shekinah presence, the spirit of his glory, which is the, the fragrance and the essence of God. So that's all I have to say on the subject. Believest thou that? Do you have the faith to come into the holiest place of all? Do you have the faith to believe that there is such a place to come? Do you have the faith to believe that you come not by any virtue of your own or qualification other than the blood of Jesus? And that his blood and his rent side has made a new and living way, says once and for all, that God never intended for any of us, whether we're preachers or not, to live a believing life in an inhospitable world on the basis of anything less or other than the unction of God that is communicated out of his presence. And that his presence is available because the veil is rent. And we're told to come boldly to the throne of grace to find help in time of need. So often a man will come with his own agenda and his own intention and his own opinion, will find some supportive scripture that seems to confirm it and present that as the message, who has not sought the Lord with a whole dependency. And so it's rare for us to hear a word that comes out of the holy place of God. And God even says of the other words, you steal it from one another. So there's a famished body of Christ that has not received the life-giving words because they're only to be obtained in one place. Does everybody know the chorus within the veil? 
I now do come. I will we'll teach it to you. It's a precious chorus. <coughs> This whole uh, revelation about um, the holiest place of all, where you need not be an ironic high priest coming once in the year, but as frequently as you desire and as you seek him, came through a brother's tapes called Within the Veil that had come to me some years ago that I almost turned off when I heard his southern accent and his uh, lack of proper grammar. And I was just about to press the stop button when something restrained me. It was something of the life coming through. The, even the, the, the accent, the, the speech, and the, and the poor English that was compelling, and I could not stop it. And I continued to hear it. It was a series of tapes, and I heard them all the way through, of a preacher who had known frustration and defeat, and up one day and, and the, down the next and despair, because he had the same urgency as Karl Barth. He knew the impossibility of bringing the Word of God as God's Word. And uh, he read the scriptures in Hebrews about the veil that's rent and come and enter boldly. And uh, he had not the faith to attempt it. But he was encouraged, and he describes how finally he came. And something of a new kind happened and has been consistently his experience ever since. And I myself was going through that rising up and down, good days and bad days. And I remember on the second or third night of hearing these tapes, I shut the machine off at that point, and I prayed and I said, Lord, now by faith, without any other qualification, there's not to do with any virtue or giftedness of my, on my own, I believe I am coming now into the holiest place of all through a new and living way made through the blood of Jesus and his rent side, that I might wait before you and your presence and receive from you the things that are out of your heart and, and uh, convey your life. And that's it. And I said, Amen. And there were no uh, bells going off or trumpets or glorious things to attend it. And uh, the next day I was walking to the Ben Israel prayer meeting and there was something simmering in my spirit of a new kind. And the Lord impressed me to share that same message with the Ben Israel family. And Paul Volk, who said he felt like that leper who had gone down into that river, how many times? Uh, that, he said, that this was that one last time. Can he believe this? Can he trust this? Is this another vain hope? Is this another uh, 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 answer for his distress and frustration? Another gimmick? Another new vogue that will pass? Or is this the definitive way of God? And so at the end of my sharing in that prayer time, I just invited people to pray as I had prayed. And Paul prayed. And it was for him a turning point. And I trust remains so to this day, so long as his faith will lay hold. The chorus goes like this. Within the veil I now do come Into the holy place to look upon his face I see such beauty there No feather can compare I worship you, O Lord Within the veil You follow that? Within the To the holy place. Into the holy place. To look upon your face. To look upon your face. I see such beauty there. I see such beauty there. None other can compare. Thank you that there is such a place. You're not playing games with us. 
you're not teasing us, you're not putting before us misty, vague things that have not the hope of substantial promise. You've called us to the most exacting, requiring life to which men can be called in the earth, to stand before the Lord of all the earth, and not only to stand for Him and with Him, but to stand as anointed trees, anointed vessels, sons and daughters of oil. And Lord, surely you would not call us to this were there not also a provision made, a place of communion where there might be an actual impartation of the spirit of your glory as often as we will seek you and believe you in that place for it. And I'm asking my God that the faith of the children whom you've collected to yourself tonight would be enlarged to believe for that. That, you, that you've not asked them to succeed on the uh, narrow limits of their own humanity and ability, but the overflowing, wonderful grace of the life of God, the oil, the unction of the Holy One Himself, available out of your presence. So Lord, may they be a coming tonight and tomorrow and as often, my God, as we will, to find not only the things that you would have us to speak, which alone is your word, but the unction by which it is to be spoken out of the very same presence. Thank you for the blood of the Lamb that made a new and living way. Thank you for the flesh of the Messiah that was rent, by which that curtain was torn apart, that we might have continual and frequent access as the holy priesthood into that presence, my God, as the very source of life itself. Oh, may your life go forth, my God, again and again, in every obedience that requires a suffering of death, that life might come to the dying. And we thank you and give you praise for so great provision in Yeshua's holy name. Amen.